It's actually a tremendous pleasure and a real honor to be able to give a talk uh, to you this afternoon. Okay. Um, so the talk uh, has the title, it's a little bit long, Return of a Large Migratory Predator, Bluefin Tuna to Northern European Waters. Why did it come back? And how can we keep it coming back? So um, the objective that I'm going to uh, discuss this afternoon is something that I've been working on for a few years. Uh, and it's really to understand factors affecting the long-term dynamics of the presence and absence of the species in northern European waters. Uh, and I will use the phrase northern European waters uh, throughout this presentation. And by that, I mean the Norwegian Sea, North Sea, Kagar uh, Skagerrak, uh, Kattegat, and Orason. The other uh, thing I want to say about the presentation is that a lot of the material and a lot of the results that I'm going to present this afternoon have not even been published yet. We're still working on analyses, writing manuscripts, and so on. Um, so that has the, uh, the perhaps a disadvantage that you will hear my opinion or my view on how I am interpreting some data. So in that case, it may not necessarily meet up to peer review standards. It will hopefully someday when we actually submit the manuscripts. On the other hand, it has the advantage uh, that I can get some feedback and input from you. Uh, hopefully I will have some time after the presentation either here in the question and answer period or perhaps at the coffee break or of course you're always welcome to send an email uh, and give me your thoughts. Okay, so um, uh, I've been doing this work with a lot of colleagues uh, in, in many institutes. Um, there's a long list of them here, I cannot uh, go through them all right now. Uh, but there's people who have contributed uh, sightings and observations, not least of which are citizen scientists, people who have sent us messages saying that they see a, tu a bluefin tuna or they sent a photograph or even a video clip, uh, and lots of scientists from institutes where we've been discussing and collaborating and compiling some data. Uh, also a lot of colleagues involved with the tagging and geolocation work, and then uh, we were also just doing some process-based migration modeling. And basically the talk uh, will cover uh, all three of these uh, topics. So uh, some of you may not exactly know uh, what, what the species is about, uh, so I'll give a very brief introduction. So earlier uh, this morning, Niara ga gave a very nice uh, picture of all the different tuna species, or at least many of the different tuna species in the world. There are a lot. Um, the one that I'm talking about here is called bluefin tuna, and in fact it's the largest of the tunas, and it's probably the one that people pay most uh, to eat, uh, to catch, and even to watch. So on the Japanese market, uh, it costs around 2,000 Swedish kroner, maybe up to 3,000 uh, kroner for a kilogram. At least that's the wholesale price. In terms of uh, people having an interest to catch it. Uh, a lot of the anglers that are taking part in our tagging project, they are paying on average uh, uh, from their own pocket voluntarily to take part in our tagging operations somewhere on the order of 24 to 80,000 Swedish kroner a year in their expenses. And a lot of people uh, actually travel around the world to go and try to catch these. They go to the Mediterranean, they go to Canary Islands or other places. So there's a lot of interest. And, uh, oops, let's go back one. Uh, you can now even go out in the Orasund and pay a lot of money to watch uh, bluefin tuna jump. And in fact, my wife and I did that about two months ago and had a very nice trip. Um, so uh, it's a very um, desirable species uh, from many perspectives. In terms of the biology, the tunas that actually show up around Denmark and Sweden uh, they are on the order of uh, 200, 250 kilograms. Uh, this is a tail from one. Uh, so they weigh roughly two or three times, each one of us in this room. Um, and they get to be around uh, two meters, two and a half meters, at least the ones that are coming in uh, around uh, Denmark and Sweden now. 
Uh, they are mostly adults and larger juveniles which come up uh, this far north. They're a seasonal migrant. Uh, they migrate north in the summer, primarily for feeding on species such as garfish, herring and mackerel and mesoplagics, even farther north. As you heard also this morning, they spawn primarily in the Mediterranean and Gulf of Mexico. And uh, certainly some of them do migrate back and forth uh, across the Atlantic. Um, in terms of what has happened with bluefin tuna in this area, this is a picture of the uh, landings that have been uh, reported. And you can see in the early decades of the 1900s, there wasn't very much. Um, uh, but then the landings increased a lot in the 1940s and 50s. This was primarily due to increased effort. And then, quite suddenly, in the early 1960s, the landings basically stopped and, and the, the fishery uh, declined. There were still a few uh, landings in the 70s, even into the early 1980s, but nothing like what there was in the 1950s and 60s. So some of these data in the early decades are not even in ICES, they're not in ICAT, and uh, they're data that we compiled and, and made into a paper about the development of the fishery in the early decades. <coughs> So the, the increase, as I say, is mainly due to an increase in effort, more attention, more demand. Uh, the reasons for the decline aren't particularly well known. Um, partly they haven't really been investigated. Uh, they weren't investigated at the time when the decline happened. And um, it's really only in the past 10 or 15 years or so where we've actually uh, tried to f find out what happened, why did they disappear? Um, and related to that, of course, is uh, why have they come back? So schematically, a, a time uh, line looks something like this. In the early decades, uh, they, were they were present, and I'll show some uh, images about that in a few minutes. Uh, the fishing pressure increased, and then there was a long period of several decades where they were basically extremely rare. Um, perhaps there was a few stragglers around, but not very many. Um, so, uh, the, question, the key questions is why did they disappear in the first place and why did they come back? So in fact this period when they had disappeared was really becoming a, a classic example of Daniel Pauly's shifting baseline syndrome. In other words, our perception of what is in the sea right now in our lifetimes is really our, our reality or our perception of what has been there always. But in fact, that's not the case. If we go back and look, actually look in our history books a little bit, we can see that things were somewhat different then than they are now. And then, uh, fortunately, they have uh, come back. So, um, some we actually had some comments from people who had seen them um, when they started to come back. And people, some of these people were fishermen. They had spent a professional life on the water, and they say they've never seen uh, this fish before, and some people even said, well, uh, I didn't even know it was actually here. Uh, so it had actually started to uh, disappear from people's uh, memory and um, perception of what actually lives, uh, say, in the Orosund or in the Skagerrak or in the Kattegat. So how do we investigate a species like this? It's a highly migratory species. It's only seasonally present. It's actually a challenge. Um, uh, we're doing it using sort of three approaches. One is to look back at historical data, retrospective analyses of existing data, uh, both fishery data for tuna, fishery data for other species, o ocean ecosystem data, temperatures, food, and so on. Um, then we have another element where we're actually analyzing new data, and this involves the tagging and the tracking work. And then uh, we're actually developing models to try to help us understand why they choose to go where they go. So, um, in the terms of what uh, evidence there was that they were actually here before the commercial fishery started, well, this is a paper published in 1927, and uh, the author uh, plotted out on a map uh, positions of where bluefin tuna had been caught up until publication of that paper, so in 1927. So they were certainly present in the early decades. Another kind of evidence that we have are observers from the UK Fisheries Laboratory of bluefin tuna schools, entire schools in the Dogger Bank area during herring fisheries. So what we're seeing here is the time of first appearance and last appearance in each year of when the observers are actually seeing schools. So they actually have the specific dates, so we know the seasonality, 
But even before that, uh, the observers were seeing schools already, uh, at least from 1912, that's when they had the first reports. In addition, uh, we also know that they were present from other data sources. This is a, a, quite an interesting data set. Uh, this is actually from Sweden. This is tuna sales in Gothenburg Harbor uh, from 1913 to 1919, uh, presented by uh, another natural history museum, in fact. And these data, again, as I say, these are not in ICES, they're not in uh, ICAP database. So at some point, they did come back, as most of you know. Um, so how do we know they come back? I mean, there was no commercial fishery for them. We didn't have the usual fishery monitoring data that we have for cod and herring and plaice and all these other species. There was no commercial, there was no survey data for them either. So the, the way that we know that they came back was that people told us, basically citizen scientists, recreational fishermen, sport fishermen, people on ferries, and so on. So that's the kind of information uh, that we have been compiling and making into a database. So the information that we see is sometimes, if we're really lucky, they actually send us a photograph. And some of these photographs are pretty cool. This one is actually has a garfish in its mouth. Uh, there is now an eco-tour operation from the Orson's Aquarium. Uh, they have actually been going out and they made this kind of cool video. Oh, there's sound. And you might see a couple of splashes. And if you're really lucky, you might see something like that. Um, <laughs> that went a bit fast. Maybe we try it again. <laughs> So, <laughs> hello. <laughs> uh, so, occasionally you might see an observation like that. Um, and uh, this is actually another kind of a cool video clip that somebody made. Um, in, in the Orison, uh, there's actually a garfish up there, either being pushed out of the water or jumping out, swimming for its life. Uh, let me see if this will run. It's in slow motion. So two of them jumping out of at the same time. Again, two more jumping out at the same time. Um, so pretty neat. I, I want to play once again, because the one that comes up over here, uh, maybe didn't see it on the first one, but it actually was uh, catching a garfish in its mouth. It, the tuna actually opens its mouth and catches. Uh, uh, so. so, kind of interesting stuff. So we have managed to gather uh, quite a few observations like this. Um, and then put them in a database, it's geo-referenced, we know the exact dates, and we have pretty good information about the latitude longitude. Uh, so then we can make uh, these kind of maps. Uh, so these data we have is from 2007 to 2022. <coughs> um, so what can we do with these kinds of data? Well, we can make the maps by year. This is aggregated all years, all uh, seasons of the year. And uh, we can sort of it investigate a little bit about how quickly th the recovery of bluefin tuna or the return of bluefin tuna happened and over what spatial area it happened. So in uh, 2011 and 2012, these are some of our earliest observations. Uh, so we have a cluster of observations up here near Iceland and later or uh, in the same year also down here in the English Channel and here in the... Um, Orison. And then in 2012, again, um, fairly widespread distribution um, in these uh, relatively early years after um, the recovery started to happen. So what does this mean? Uh, well, whoops, let's go back there. Uh, so this indicates that there was a fairly rapid uh, rediscovery of former 
and in some cases even new habitats, the Demerac Strait up in East Greenland, during the biomass recovery in the early 2010s. This also implies a fairly rapid learning and or exploratory search behavior uh, for prey uh, in the region. And it, it also implies a fairly uh, large spatial area over which uh, this uh, search behavior was happening. Well, why do they actually come to Northern York in the first place? Is it by chance? I mean, when they come out of the Mediterranean, some of them come out of the Mediterranean, and then they have to, they either go west, they go north, or they go south. Um, so what is the chances are that they actually would come up to the Skagerrak or, or the Kattegat? Um, and some of them actually showing up in our waters. Um, if they come by chance, in other words, if there was a school that came up, those individuals, if they come by chance, what's the chances of them coming back another year? The same individuals coming back another year? Or instead, maybe a different subgroup or different populations come back in the next year, so that the ones we see this year, they may just be a random pluck of the entire population, and some of them the following year go someplace else. So is it completely random, or is there some kind of pattern or structure in this? So if they come by chance, would we ever see the same individual come back again? And would we ever see it come back two years in a row? Uh, so these questions, or hypotheses, these can be tested directly using uh, advanced tagging data, which uh, we'll hear a little bit more about later. So why do they come back? Or why do they come to northern Europe? Well, maybe they come here when there's lots of tuna in the northeast Atlantic. They simply spread out to avoid competition uh, farther south or in other areas. So more fish, they cover a larger area, maybe. They come here because there's lots to eat, maybe. They come here because it's getting warmer. I think everybody is aware that the sea temperatures are rising. Or they come here because big predators, including fishy boats, maybe scare them away from someplace else, sort of the ecology of fear. Well, who cares why they come here? Well, it's actually quite important to know why they come here. Because maybe we can do something about it to encourage them to come back year on year on year. Such as fishing on the tunas. Or fishing on the food for the tunas. These are things that, in fact, society can control to some extent. At least if there's a political will for it. So it's actually quite important to try to understand what the mechanisms are of why they come back or why they do not come back. Well, I mentioned that the landings, at least in Northern Europe, declined in the 1960s. Um, well, as the decades went on, the fishing effort throughout the whole range increased and the total biomass of the stock was going down. Um, and in fact, for several decades, in the, especially in the 90s, the early 2000s, uh, the stock was overexploited. Um, and in fact, governments applied quotas that exceeded the scientific recommendation based on sustainability principles. And you can see that here in this graph. Uh, this is the scientifically recommended quotas, and the catches were much higher, uh, even though the quota itself was too high for su sustainability purposes. So there was issues there in terms of what the quota should be relative to sound biology. And in, in addition, there was issues there related to monitoring and control of the catches. So there was a lot of illegal and unreported catches uh, going on. So basically, it was too easy to cheat, given the value of the species. So eventually, things got so bad that the International uh, Commission for Conservation of the An Atlantic Tunas finally agreed on a recovery plan in 2007, and it had at least three important management changes. Changes. Uh, one was that the total quota was reduced by around 60 percent. There was also an increase in the minimum landing size, so that now it became pretty much uh, only legal to catch a tuna that was sexually mature. 
basically the idea was to try to reduce the uh, exploitation, legal or otherwise, of uh, juvenile bluefin tuna. In other words, give the juveniles a chance to at least get close to spawning once and reproducing and producing new offspring. So the minimum landing size increased uh, ap approximately to the size at which they become uh, first mature. And on top of this, there is much improved uh, fishery control and uh, compliance. So the regulations uh, were more uh, effective and uh, are being followed better. So what are the consequences of implementing this kind of a recovery plan? Well, it seems like it has worked. So we've gone basically from relatively few tuna to more tuna. And to see a little bit of data, this is the decrease in fishing pressure, increase in stock biomass. So two responses already there in a relatively short period of time. And we're now seeing expansion of range to former, formerly occupied habitats, perhaps to reduce density dependent competition. So they're back in northern European waters, and in fact they're even have been found in waters where we hadn't really known that they uh, went to, like up in the Denmark Strait. So maybe the overall numbers, or the overall biomass of bluefin tuna affects to some extent the chances that they actually show up around Denmark and Sweden. But what else? Well, food. So they come to Northern Europe mainly to feed. They don't come to spawn, at least not yet. Maybe sometime in the future that might happen, but at least uh, right now they don't come to spawn. So they have evolved a life history to migrate um, to relatively northern areas to feed on large schools of fish like the herring and the mackerel and also the garfish that we saw on the video. So how does food play into this? And what has been the dynamics of at least some of the major prey species? Well, this is the time series of the spawning biomass of two of the big herring stocks. Uh, one is the North Sea, and the other is the Norwegian herring stock. So what you can see here is that during the time when the tuna were really abundant, or at least the fishing was really strong, uh, there was a lot of food. At least the Norwegian stock was doing well. The North Sea stock, this is the red one, uh, actually had quite a high abundance. But those abundances were actually starting to decline in the 1960s and the 1970s. So there was sort of a parallel decline in uh, these two food resources. And eventually they got so low, I mean, they've gone from millions of tons basically to nothing, more or less nothing. The fishers had to be shut down uh, for several years to give the stocks a chance to recover, and now they have come back. So there was a declining prey abundance from the 1950s to the 1990s. And what we are thinking, or at least what I am thinking, is that this may have stimulated the tunas to feed in other places. <coughs> so the biomass of food in the local waters uh, probably also has some impact on whether the tunas are coming here or not. If that's true, it means that we here in Northern Europe we have to manage our forage fish populations in a sustainable way and perhaps take a more ecosystem approach to the management of these uh, stocks. So that's food. What else? Well, temperature. It is getting warmer. We have measurements of that. We have, there's lots of data on that. Um, this is a time series that extracted uh, for the Northeast Atlantic uh, and the Kattegat. And you can see at the end of that uh, time series, the temperature has been uh, quite a bit warmer than it has been in previous decades. So the tuna are here, the temperature is warmer. Oh, maybe it's a correlation. Maybe it's some cause effect. Well, could be. But then we, if we go back and look at our history books again, those same data sets that I showed you before, were they also present in that cold period? And yes, they were. 
So we have this relatively cold period back here when the observers from the English Fisheries Laboratory were seeing schools of bluefin tuna in the central part of the North Sea. And when people were catching bluefin tuna in the Skagerrak and selling them at Gothenburg Harbor. So I think uh, temperature is probably not the main reason why there was a decline in the, or the disappearance of the bluefin tuna from our waters back in the 1960s. Uh, and I'm not entirely convinced that it's responsible for their return. Well, so what, what was going on when they were disappearing? Well, there's two factors that seem to be important. Uh, they became rare here as two events were happening. There was an increasing exploitation of bluefin tuna throughout its range, higher catches, also higher catches of juveniles. There was a reduction in the population size and probably an effect on density dependence and the uh, area or the range that they were occupying. In other words, a contraction process going on. And then secondly, there was an increasing exploitation of the prey of the bluefin tuna in northern Europe, especially the North Sea herring, the Norwegian herring, the mackerel. These stocks were collapsing uh, during those decades. So the preliminary conclusion is that a smaller tuna population had less incentive to migrate here, so they stopped coming until conditions changed. Okay, so um, that's a little bit about sort of historical data or a re retrospective analysis of what has been happening in the past. Uh, we have been doing some tagging studies since 2017, um, so I'll talk a little bit about that now. So we have been uh, tagging, um, mainly in the Skagerrak, but most recently in the last couple of years also in the Orison. Uh, we've been doing this together with uh, Gustav and his colleagues at RCLU. Um, so the idea is that we put on these advanced uh, data storage tags, uh, satellite transmitting tags, which record temperature, light, and depth. And from that, we can derive, using geolocation methods, the swim route that they've took. Uh, while the tag has been uh, deployed. And our main objective with this is to try to identify the factors affecting the migration to or from uh, northern European waters. And also to investigate whether the tunas actually show feeding site fidelity. I think most of us are probably aware that a lot of species show fidelity to spawning sites, um, but there's fewer studies, I think, that show fidelity excuse me, to feeding areas. So uh, we have actually started to publish some of our results. Uh, our first paper came out uh, last year in um, scientific reports. I don't have time to go through all the details or all the results of this, so I'll just pick the one that's probably most relevant to this presentation this afternoon. Um, so we have a tag return um, from a 12-month deployment. So this was a tuna th that the tag stayed on a full 12-month uh, period. So this enabled us to see the complete uh, cycle back to the spawning area and then away from the spawning area again. So this one uh, was tagged up here, uh, came down in the Central North Sea, came down and spent some time in the Bay of Biscay, came in to the Mediterranean, and we were pretty sure it spawned, and then came back out and then came back up to the Norwegian Sea and came back into the North Sea again. And that's where the tag came off. It was programmed to come off after a year. So we have a 12-month deployment, and this one shows that the same tuna came back uh, basically to the area where we had tagged it. We had one more uh, tag that stayed on uh, the full 12 months. And that one basically did the same thing in terms of coming back to the place where we had tagged it or coming back to the feeding area. So again, it started up up here, came down, spent some time out here, and then came back up again. So two of the two tags basically showed a return to the site where we had tagged it. Well, this seems a bit unlikely. Um, uh, if the tunas only come to Sweden and Denmark by chance, that two fish 
uh, that we managed to have a tag stay on for 12 months. Both of them come back. Okay. Um, but it's only based on two fish. Um, so we need more data. So again, we went out in 2018. 2018, we programmed the tags to come off after eight months, not 12 months, so I'm not going to show any of those data. But then in 2019, we did program all the tags to come off after 12 months. We managed to have 26 of the tags that actually stayed on for the 12 months. And of the 26, 21 came back to the Skagerrak and Kattegat. So now, both years combined, we have 23 of 28, or more than 80% of the tag tunas, the same ones coming back the following year. So this does not seem to be a purely random process when 80% of them are coming back. Um, so it also suggests that there does seem to be some fidelity to the feeding area by at least these large uh, individual tunas. So it's a group that comes back uh, in at least consecutive years. Okay. I mentioned, um, I think I should probably finish up pretty soon. Um, so we're also trying to figure out ways that we can actually uh, quantify some of this migration behavior and to try to use these data and also some of the other related data on the distribution in some migration models to figure out what kind of decisions do they take? What are the factors affecting the decisions about where tunas uh, go to after they come out of the Mediterranean? So we have actually developed almost 10 years ago now two approaches or tools based on completely different mechanisms about the migration behavior. One approach is based on collective memory and social learning and knowledge transfer among individuals. So within a group, some of the individuals are perhaps could be considered to be leaders, and those ones perhaps guide the rest of the other ones. So the other ones simply follow these other ones. And these leaders somehow have discovered a feeding area, maybe by simply random swimming behavior or vagary, vagrants, uh, that they have found a feeding habitat. And then somehow they recognize that or remember that and then come back the following year. And then in the intervening year, other individuals join them or f follow them. So there's a whole series of something like 80 equations to describe that process in the paper. So that's a relatively behavioral-based uh, analysis or, or modeling approach. The other approach, and okay, this partly explains why we're now seeing the same individuals, uh, tunas coming back in, in consecutive years. The other approach is more based on optimal foraging theory. So let's say in the whole North Atlantic, there may be f five or eight main feeding areas, say in the Norwegian Sea, Bay of Biscay, south of Iceland, maybe off Canary Islands or somewhere in the central Atlantic. So when the tunas come out of the Mediterranean, they sort of decide or they go to a particular area, but there's a cost to go to every location. I mean, even for a tuna, which is a fantastic swimmer, they need energy to burn. So there's some cost to getting to these different places. So the cost to get there somehow has to be balanced with how much energy they might get when they're actually there. So that depends on how much food is in that feeding area and how many others, how many other tuna come there and compete with them for the same food. So we have developed a bioenergetic, spatially resolved, optimal foraging model as well. As I said, these are two completely different modeling approaches, and what we're now trying to do is to combine them. In other words, to put some, maybe some spatial aspect into this, or to put this behavioral social learning processes and mechanisms into the bioenergetics. If we can do that, then I think we'll be able to investigate migration behavior, the spatial distributions, and the habitat use in response to ecosystem and fishing conditions. In addition, if we know roughly how many tuna are going to a given geographic area, such as, well, 
over here or up here or up here, if we know how many tuna are going there and they're going there to feed, then that will be able to give us some information about the effect of tuna on the food web or on their prey. So that gives us some information about the food web or the predation impact by tunas in the different areas. So that's where we're going with that. That should contribute to an ecosystem-based approach to bluefin tuna management. Um, and this whole idea of combining these two modeling approaches, that's the topic of a newly started PhD project that we have. So if we have a vision, oh, I want to go back. <laughs> uh, if we have a vision of having bluefin tuna sort of in the northern European waters, or in Skagerrak, Kattegat, Orosun, um, uh, and to have the species present every year, um, what do we need to achieve that? And the idea is that we don't want to have this happen again. No half-century disappearances. How do we prevent that? Well, I think that means we have to have sustainable exploitation of the bluefin tuna, sustainable exploitation of the main prey species, the herring and the mackerel, for instance. This, again, implies some integrated ecosystem-based approach to fishery management, which isn't in place yet. And I think we need to continue monitoring the presence and the biology in the region so that we can detect changes uh, in the future. So quickly for some conclusions, bluefin tuna have returned, not just for one or two years, but for longer. We have many different kinds of evidence for this. The reasons for the disappearance and return, well, I think it's mainly due to variations in exploitation of the tunas and their prey. We need sustainable ecosystem-based management for both the tuna and their prey. And we're producing new science, and it's making progress to understand processes affecting distribution and habitat use. And I think we can combine that with the kinds of studies that Nayara has been talking about earlier this morning, and also that I know Dave Brighton uh, has been doing as well. So I will stop there, and if there's any time for questions, I would be happy to take them. If not, then come and get me at the coffee break. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A great talk and such an amazing, successful story in a sense. I think everybody should really need yeah. it. We need good stories from the sea right now. So, questions? Thanks, Gustav. <coughs> um, thanks a lot. Um, I have a question more from the sort of management side, and it's we've seen the uh, the magnificent return, obviously, but not quite the reasons why. Why did this management, the recovery plan, work? And that's something that managers like myself and others have been trying to get out of ICAT and out of ISIS and scientists. But we've never been able to get an evaluation of why the recovery plan really worked and that would be so useful for management so um can we can can we get that at one point <laughs> because otherwise we i don't think we will ever learn anything um from the management side in order to adapt to these qu these questions that you raised in the end so we really need to know what part of the recovery plan worked was it uh, increased um was, was it increased surveillance, getting rid of the um, illegal fisheries? Was it, was it respecting the quotas generally? That would be, that would really be useful. Thank you. Yes, I don't know if anybody's actually tried to uh, uh, identify why the recovery plan worked in terms of what the, the management actions that were put in place. Um, what changed that they actually worked in sort of 2007, 8, 9, 10? Because earlier there had been some discussions and, um, and some of the changes weren't implemented. Um, so maybe the situation was simply getting so desperate um, that the countries and the fishing industry sort of said, well, okay, we have to do it. I think another important aspect was that there was a huge public pressure 
uh, launched by many NGOs during the 2000s, um, who put a lot of pressure on ICAT and the government agencies to act. So there was clear, uh, I, think that I think ICAT was realizing that they're sort of at risk and they really need to act. And ICAT is composed of the EU and all the other countries that are exploiting the stock. So in terms of that, I think there was, uh, there was that element in it. In terms of the individual regulations that changed, whether it's increasing the minimum landing size or improving the fishery surveillance and the monitoring or reducing the quotas, I think all of those things had a help. All of them. Uh, anything else or no time? I think we don't have time. All right. We should have a whole symposium on bluefin tuna. I think that's <laughs> actually a, a good idea. Thank you so much, uh, Brian. I think you should have your...